Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm your host, Habitual Line Crosser, and today we're talking about the Aegis. 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 Look, it's spelled with an A, but apparently it's pronounced with an E. And today I went down the fucking rabbit hole. Jesus Christ. So let's talk about it. All right, first of all, what is an Aegis? Aegis, look, it says, Google says Aegis, but I say Aegis because I, I don't know, I enjoy being wrong. Uh, first off, props to the guy who named this thing. Uh, by the way, that was uh, Captain L.J. Stetcher, S-T-E-C-H-E-R, um, who then later on said that, hey, we should uh, make it an acronym, and the Navy said no. So good on him for coming up with the name, good on the Navy for telling him no, because every day I constantly hear, Patriots, an acronym, stands for phased array truck. It's not an acronym. It's not a fucking acronym it's just not ever will never be an acronym i i take points away from my students when they capitalize it like it's an acronym i want you to know that and i teach patriot okay anyways so what is aegis well aegis aegis whatever the fuck it's called it happens to be zeus's shield now it's depicted in a couple of different ways one is that he's carrying it it's like a boom broad shield cool and then it's got a uh, uh oh it's a symbol of something on it i have it around here somewhere oh sometimes featuring the head of a gorgon whatever the fuck that is but sometimes it's also depicted as something he wears it is often metal or it is a skin type thing and what it is is it's it's something that protects zeus the god of gods and it's a pretty cool fucking name for any kind of missile defense system because well as i went down the aegis rabbit hole jesus it's it's skynet that's that's the really the easiest way to explain what aegis is it's fucking skynet like i knew as an air defender like i knew it was good right like i knew it was good and i'm sure that there's gonna be some people out there and i went down the aegis rabbit hole i found a lot of conflicting information navy yours is equally as confusing to follow as it is mine so i'm very proud of you guys talking about ranges differences this radar versus this radar this missile versus this missile so i'm doing a broad overview because if i threw all of those numbers at you it would confuse you guys more than it confused me and um for all of my aegis operators out there i'm sure you're going to be in my comment section and possibly in my email saying hey you were wrong about this look man i'm going from what i found on the internet and i hope i come with receipts so first things first now that we have talked about what aegis is it's zeus's shield whether it was carried or whether it was worn it is his shield right so the system came around uh they originally like so the way the military works is they say we need this thing and then they put out an open contract and then a contractor says we can do it for this much and another one says we can do it for this much and we can do it for this much right so that is a the the project and each company comes up with their own material solution for that project and the navy said we need something called advanced surface missile system asms in 1964 uh and originally okay so aegis has passed hands a few times originally it was uh developed by the surface Ma uh, radar division of the rca which is later acquired by general electric and then uh it was then sold off to ge aerospace who then sold it to martin marietta and now it's part of lockheed martin and has been since 1995 so anyways, in 1964, they came up with this thing, and in 1969, Captain L.J. Stetcher, I think I said that right, um, came up with, when they put it out an open-ended thing, like, we need to name this something cool, and he was like, what about Aegis? It's Zeus's shield, and that's really fucking cool. Um, I did submit my own for IBCS, the new system we have coming online, the Integrated Air Missile Defense Battle Command System. My suggestion was the Debauchery Missile Defense System. I think it's a that will strike fear into the enemy because they're like these guys have no idea what they're doing this thing's obviously debauchery and it's like what, is it is it we just taking the piss as the brits might say all right so um <clears throat> i do want to read this part because uh to understand how this ship came to be which by the way i thought an aegis combat system was just on an early burke class destroyer that was the furthest thing from the fucking truth. It's on like five different platforms, but the main two that we're going to talk about is the Ticonderoga class cruisers and the Arleigh Burke class destroyers. Because the Ticonderoga class was the first one to get it, and they have been steadily improving it and putting it on board the Arleigh Burke class destroyers. So the first engineering development model, EDM-1, um, was installed in a test ship, the USS Norton Sound, in 1973. During this time frame, the Navy envisioned instilling an or installing the Aegis combat system on both nuclear powered strike cruiser or CSGN and a conventionally powered destroyer originally designated DDG 47. DDGs are a thing that we have now. This is back before DDGs even existed. The CSGN was to be the new 17,200 ton cruiser design uh, based on the earlier California Virginia class cruisers. The Aegis 
destroyer design would be based on the gas turbine powered Spruance class. When the CSGN was canceled, they canceled the program. Uh, the Navy proposed a modified Virginia class design, CGN 42, with a new superstructure design for the Aegis combat system. I'm bouncing back and forth between Aegis and Aegis. I know I'm doing that. It's probably mild dyslexia or maybe some of the tism, but we'll get through it. Um, anyways. With a displacement of 12,100 tons, as compared to the CSGN, this design was not as survivable and had reduced command and control facilities for embarked flag officer. Oh dear. It probably didn't have enough room for the flag officer. Like, I've never heard of, it didn't have good enough command and control facilities. Like, bro, we control Patriot units from fucking tents. Don't give me that shit, Navy. It was either A, too expensive, or B... Your, your, just, your flag officer was, was a douche and just didn't like what it was. Um, anyways, ultimately, the des design was also canceled during the Carter administration due to its increased cost. Oh, there it is. There's the money. Compared to the non-nuclear DDG-47. With this cancellation of the CGN-42 and the DDG-47, Aegis Destroyer was redesignated as the CG-47 Guided Missile Cruiser. So right now, uh, they have the Aegis system on... Oh, man. It's like four different platforms. I didn't write them all down. I'm sorry. Um... And it's also our allies have it, uh, several different allies, Canadians, the Spanish, the uh, Japanese were the first ones to get it. Uh, well, Canadians don't have it yet. It's projected, sorry. Uh, and the French. So then my beautiful fucking TISM powered brain went, well, if I'm going to explain the Aegis combat system and what it does, I have to explain the type of boats that it's on board and their armament. Because, like, people don't care. Like, I could talk about, you know, displacement, speed, capability, turn radius. But, like, all that shit's bullshit. Like, it really is bullshit because none of it's fucking true, right? But if I tell you what guns are on board, it's like, okay, that, that makes a little bit more fucking sense, right? Um, so before we get on to exactly how Aegis works or Aegis works and what it does, let's talk about these boats. So the, uh, the, the Ticonderoga class, right now we have five Ty... The numbers... The numbers are hard to get because I have one source that I found that said we have over a hundred Aegis combat systems on the, the ocean. Another one said we had 70. Uh, and then I have one that said we had 40. So I always go with the low number to just kind of save myself rather than the high number because it makes it sound like I'm inflating numbers if I go high, but it makes it sound like, you know, I'm being conservative if I go low. So I went with the 40, which states that there are five Ticonderoga class cruisers still in service. We've had, uh, I think, 12 throughout history, but the rest of them are, are shut down with the exception of these five. And they carry around 122 missiles in the vertical launch systems. Um, and then they have eight harpoons on the back, the anti-ship missiles. So inside those 122 VLS, the Mark... Mark 41. There we go. I had to look it back up. I wrote it down. I know I wrote it. Guys, you should see my notes. It looks chaotic over here. And now I found Mark 41 VLS. God damn it. God bless America. Anyways, okay. So the Mark 41 VLS, right? There's 122 of them on there. I've heard there was 120 and another one said 130. Uh, so I just went with 122 because I found another source that said 122. Um, so with that, in there, they can put standard missile twos, standard missile threes, and standard missile sixes. Well, what's the difference between these types of interceptors? Okay, so to kind of put the SM twos and SM sixes in perspective, a, a six is a spicy two. Right? So a two is designed mainly for cruise missiles, air breathing targets or air breathing threats or ABTs, planes, aircraft, helicopters, things like that, right? Standard missile six is the same thing as a two. It just goes further, right? It can just reach further out there. And SM3 is designed for <laughs> mid-range and what do they call it? Short to long or medium to long range ballistic missiles. But it's also important to note that in November of 2002, an SM3 was used on board a, a Ticonderoga class cruiser to intercept a target, a ballistic missile in space. It was fired off a CG-70, uh, one of the, the Ticonderoga class cruisers. Uh, so they did that in 2002. It was uh, the USS, it's named after one of the Great Lakes. Lake Erie, I wanna say that was it. I didn't write the name down, that's on me. I fucked that up. But anyways, so they are designed to reach exo-atmospheric. So the kind of agreed upon area of the atmosphere is the Carmen line. It's not spelled like Carmen, like your girlfriend, Carmen. It's spelled in a weirdly, really weird, weird way, but it's pronounced Carmen line. And it's 100 kilometers up. That is kind of the agreed upon like edge of space for everybody. So if you shoot anything above the Carmen line, it's considered an exo-atmospheric engagement. Um, at least that was the standards back in the 40s the last time I really checked into it. Uh, I don't know if the standards are different nowadays. I don't, I'm not really sure. 
All right, so it's got all these missiles on board, right? And then it's got the eight harpoons on the back, which are anti-ship missiles, which uh, can go around, from what I was reading, around 100 nautical miles, and they carry a 500-pound warhead. And they're designed to fucking sink your boat quick, fast, and in a hurry. That's the way they're built. They do make ones that have a little bit longer range. They have a smaller warhead, and their thought process is we can compensate for the smaller warhead by making the missile move faster. So that's what they did. I don't know the speed difference between the two. I wasn't able to find that kind of detail. It will behoove you to get yourself some Aerial Resupply Coffee with amazing, beautiful flavors like 15W40, Moab, Spring Kitty, Christmas Kitty, Pumpkin Kitty, and of course all our other favorites. And for those of you out there who are like, well, I really like the taste of coffee, but I do have a caffeine sensitivity. Is there anything for me? Absolutely. There is caffeine-free Aerial Resupply Coffee. For those of you who just need a little coffee to get you out of bed in the morning, but you don't want the caffeine to jitter you out or crash at the end of the day. Use discount code HABIT or click on the link in the description of this video to get yourself 10% off your order. Or there's always the possibility that you could drink tea and have beans for breakfast. This is what Paul Revere saved us from. Get yourself some Aerial Resupply coffee today. All right. So it also has a triple 324 millimeter, two of them, by the way, uh, torpedo launchers for Mark 46 and Mark 50 torpedoes. Um, these can also be fired from the vertical launch system on board both ships. So the Ticonderoga class cruisers and the Arleigh Burke class destroyers can both fire missiles out of the vertical launch system. So imagine this, right? You're you know cruising in your little submarine. You're trying to sneak up on the bad guys. They fire a missile. You're like, I'm safe. That's going into the air. Where's that going? And all of a sudden it dives into the water and hunts your bitch ass down i can't think of anything fucking scary like honestly i i like I, being in a sub would scare me in general to begin with but now like that's like that fucking meme where he's like ah call an ambulance because your job is to hunt boats right so there's this boat that just turned the tables he's like call an ambulance call an ambulance but not for me like that's exactly what just happened when you fire torpedoes out of a vertical launch system designed for missiles because we're America, and this is what we do. We we build shit just fucking because, right? Okay, so it can do that as well. It also has two Mark 45, 127 millimeter, these are often referred to as the five inch guns, capable of hitting a target at 22 kilometers with a 32 kilogram shell at 20 rounds a minute. And anyone who's ever like, man, the Iranians are always sneaking up on our boats. Trust me, we know they're there. We just haven't, like, the can of whoop ass is on the shelf and we're just waiting for the skipper to be like, yeah, you should open that. That, that can right now, let's just, just crack it. And then that's when you let out the five inch guns. Okay. They have two C Wiz, which is the close in weapon system, which is like R2D2 with a fucking, yeah, we're not going to say that on, on YouTube. Uh, really pissed off R2D2. Fires 3,000 rounds a minute, but the Block 1Bs fire 4,000 rounds per minute. As if, as if 3,000 rounds per minute of 20 millimeter high explosive shells just wasn't, wasn't enough. Wasn't, there's somebody, some American, I'm sorry, this is only an American, and only an American would do this in engineering. Just sit there and be like, can we get an extra thousand out of it? Lord knows how those barrels can handle up handle that shit. But then on board, just in case things get a little bit too spicy, you have two Sikorsky SH-60B Blackhawks that can, this is quoted verbatim, they can direct tactical actions by the chopper and the team on board the ship. Which to me, like I was like, what does that mean, right? Because I wanted to get in the weeds. And to me, I wasn't able to really expand on that. Maybe someone in the Navy can. Tells me that, that boat can fire shit off of that helicopter, and that helicopter can fire shit off of that boat, which is fucking scary. But that's also part of the Aegis combat system, which we'll get into. All right. Now, the main difference between the Ticonderoga-class cruiser and the Arleigh Burke-class destroyers is, aside from the size, the cruisers are bigger. Um, the Arleigh Burke-class destroyer have 26 less vertical launch system cells than the, Ar or than the Ticonderoga-class cruisers. And you would think that that's like, oh, we have 26 less missiles. That's still 90, depending on which block and variant, right? For, or excuse me, flight one versus flight two, 90 to 96 missiles uh, on board that they can just mix up with whatever, including Tomahawks, uh, Sea Sparrows, which is one of the things I forgot on the other ship. Um, but the Sea Sparrows are kind of weird because the Sea Sparrows that they have 
are actually small enough that you can fit four of them in one uh, capsule, apparently, of the VLS. So you have one capsule that normally fires one missile and now has four of them in there because now, that's the same way Patriot works, right? So our pack twos have one bird per canister and our pack threes have four birds per canister. So our normal pack two launcher can carry four birds and a pack three launcher can carry 16 birds and a pack three MSE can carry 12 birds because we thought that was the number that needed to be there because fucking America, that's the reason why, right? Um, so there's that. Uh, it does. So the Evolve Sea Sparrow missile that is set for the, the vertical launch system, some of the older ver variants have like the... Um, they look like a little, like a tower defense missile like thing. I don't know what the turret's called. Um, those ones carry eight inside there at any given time, but the vertical launch system versions are actually the, um, there you go, the RIM 162 ESSM, which is the extended Sea Sparrow missile. I believe it's what that called. Uh, and with, it has larger motor and tail control for more maneuverability. That's the main difference between the ones that are on the outside and the ones that are in the vertical launch system. Um, keep in mind that, that also, unlike, the Ticonderoga class cruisers. The Arleigh Burke class destroyers have, um, they have the this thing called, I didn't even know it existed, and I think it's pretty fucking cool. It's called a rolling airframe missile. Uh, and now pretty much what it is, is someone went, see this SeaWiz, the close-in weapon system, we're going to take the 20 millimeter off. Let's, let's just move that. And let's put some little tiny missiles on it. I don't know what kind of missiles they are. I know each one has an 11, uh, 11 missile stockpile inside it. So instead of 3,000 rounds of 20 millimeter high explosive a minute, you have 11 missiles that can be fired out of this thing at short range targets. Now for anyone going like, well, that's kind of fucked up, man. I like the Sea Whiz. Don't worry, it still has two Sea Whiz. It just also has two of these rolling airframe missiles. Um, it has two um, 25 millimeter Mark 38 Mod 1 auto cannons which is kind of cool because you can fire it remotely or you can do it like uh the movie pearl harbor with cuba gooding jr where you're like on the actual weapon and you're just like do 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 but it's 25 millimeters at 200 rounds uh, a minute because america that's that's what we do right so keep in mind vertical launch system can house tomahawks uh the torpedoes it can handle um standard missile one or excuse me two threes and sixes uh and it can also handle the Sea Sparrow missiles. So when these things are stacked, they are designed to go out for a specific purpose. So you can now tailor your missile loadout to the threat that is coming at you. And we haven't even talked about radars yet. So the Aegis combat system takes all that firepower, right? And you're like, man, that's a lot of firepower to have on one boat. Yeah, here's the, here's the problem, right? Every boat that has an Aegis combat system or a fucking radar on board, right? Like even the carrier radar, right? Ties into the Aegis combat system. If you have several destroyers and a cruiser and stuff, they're all tying in together. They're literally Skynet. Oh, don't forget, when you put F-35s in the air, those also tie in. Most other aircraft that the Navy has tie into the Aegis combat system. Do you think that's enough? No, no, no. Because they're cruising up and down the coast of the United States tying into the GMD. GMD stands for ground-based mid-course defense. It is the United States of America. It is only based in the United States. It is our intercontinental ballistic missile defense for the homeland of the United States. And Arleigh Burke class destroyers and Ticonderoga class cruisers can use the Aegis combat system and tie in those engagements for them. They can cue them and they can help guide in ground-based mid-course defense interceptors. That is fucking wild, right? But then I'm army, right? So like, why does this matter to me? Because I don't really care about things that are on the ocean. I didn't know this. This is very like wide public knowledge. Uh, did you know, I didn't, that you can tie in an Aegis, an Aegis combat system into a THAAD Tippy 2 radar. Now a THAAD Tippy 2 radar, unclassified, has a maximum range of 2,900 kilometers. Okay, to kind of explain how far down the rabbit hole that I went when it came to the Spy Series radar, which by the way, a spy radar is not one radar. It's several radars that talk in conjunction, right? Because the Aegis Combat System, Aegis Combat System, I like saying Aegis, I'm sorry. I'm just going to continue to say Aegis because America, right? So the Aegis Combat System is a conglomerate of systems and sensors that can all shoot off of one another, see what each other sees, and make these engagements like literally fucking Skynet. That's the way the system works. And when I went down the rabbit hole trying to figure out, well, what's the difference between Spy 6 and Spy 7 and, and blah, 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 blah. Well, Spy 7 has been more often chosen by a lot of uh, U.S. allies, but Spy 6 is largely the, the workhorse of the U.S. Navy. 
Spy 6 uh, is made by Raytheon. Spy 7 is made by Lockheed Martin. Uh, those are the two main differences. Uh, as for capabilities and limitations, the best number, and this is the one that I've seen the most out of everything, is 310 kilometer range. That was also Spy 1, Spy 6, and Spy 7. However, the difference between a Spy 1 and a Spy 6 is apparently um, 35 times more fidelity, which means that, remember, seeing something is easy. Engaging something, very, very difficult. So, like, for example, can a low-band radar detect stealth aircraft? Absolutely, but it doesn't have the track fidelity you would get with a high-frequency radar, so therefore it cannot engage those things, right? Um... This is why stealth technology still reigns supreme right now, because if low frequency radars could detect and engage, stealth would be a moot point. It would, it would be useless to ever use stealth anywhere in the world ever again. And right now, that's just not really a capability. So keep in mind that the Aegis combat system is just a whole bunch of different radars together. And I'm, I'm hearing, like I'm reading an article, there's like some beef uh, because Japan was supposed to field some, uh, some Aegis ashore and there were some issues with the Mark 72 booster. I found this uh, this article on, uh, was it Babcock? Spy 6 versus Spy 7. They're saying that the Spy 7 is at a distinct disadvantage because of how expensive some of the hardware pieces are and they weren't really able to get them, mainly uh, gallium nitrite. Um, I will tell you this from personal experience, uh, Lockheed Martin is really good at building stealth aircraft. The F-35 uh, radar is one of the best that has ever been on an air platform ever before. But if you were like, Build me a better radar, Raytheon or Lockheed Martin. Raytheon is way better at building radars. They're just they're just better at it, right? Like they're just they've just done it for so long. Like we have microwaves because Raytheon was fucking with radar technology. I just want you guys to know, in case you were unfamiliar with that, Raytheon, somebody working for Raytheon Technologies accidentally discovered the microwave. So that's why we have that, right? Um, Raytheon makes really, really good command and control systems. Their C2 systems are phenomenal. North of Grumman, on the other hand, makes really, really good bomber aircraft, right? So, like, everyone has their own thing that they're really good at. When you have two different contractors competing for the same thing because they both think they can do it really well, one of them is going to excel. I don't know the difference. Like, if you sat me next to two ships, one had a Spy 6, one had a Spy 7, I couldn't tell you the difference. I would have to dig into the components and talk to the operators to really understand the difference in capabilities and limitations, power output, ducting problems. I mean, everything that would affect a potential radar. So it's really, really hard to drive down that. But the main takeaway for you guys as I'm rambling here is 310 kilometer range and the Spy 6 is 30 times more sensitive than the Spy 1. Keep in mind, all of these radars, the Spy 1, Spy 6, and Spy 7 are capable of detecting, identifying, and potentially engaging up over navy does the same thing the army does when it comes to our radars over 100 tracks at any given time uh doesn't say how many birds they can have in the air at any given time i have no idea if they require track via missile slots i have no idea um no idea what their capability is but it just says it can de detect track and identify over 100 tracks at any given time so let me put this in perspective right when i tell you guys that aegis does everything that patriot does just more of it and a lot more of it the unclassified answer for american patriot is it can detect and hold and i and track like 100 tracks now aegis is saying i can do over 100 it ties into pretty much everything else it is the world's best and first um, complete defense system that is mobile. And the mobility of it is really the biggest kicker because in air defense for me, it's relatively simple. When I place my radar, right? If my radar is off kilter by a degree or a couple of degrees, it won't in place properly. It won't know where it is in this world. Now you take that and you put it on board a ship that is doing this, that is listing left and right in the ocean, and it is firing accurately. It is shooting bullets with bullets in the air that are traveling at Mach Classified. It is firing an interceptor up that goes and hunts down another interceptor. But that radar at the entire time is moving up and down, so that radar has to compensate for what is going on on the ocean. That is fucking gangster. I don't care who you are, right? I have no idea how they did that shit. My radar, I love my radar to death, but if you take a Patriot radar and you pack it up, move it two inches forward and unpack it, something broke. There's only two absolutes in air defense. Someone is going to fail their evaluation and the radar is going to break down. These are the only two things that are absolutes in air defense, right? Yeah, and I know, I get it. Siths, only Siths, Siths. I've been talking too much too fast. Only Siths deal in absolutes. I get that. I understand that. I respect you for your opinion. 
But those are the absolutes of air defense. And now, very recently, uh, Patriot and Aegis have started to come together, right? Because IBCS is going to be Aegis worldwide. Fucking prestige worldwide. Mm, prestige worldwide. I don't like. I don't know what I was getting at with that. I just it felt right, so I just went for it. But anyways, so. Think about it like that. Now you have land-based systems communicating with air-based systems, communicating with sea-based systems, and everybody can see and shoot what everybody can see and shoot. And that is why American air and missile defense is so far ahead of everybody else. No other country in the world has anything close to an Aegis combat system. So originally it was designed to protect the carrier. Now they realize that this thing moving around can create a bubble, an envelope that protects everything around it. Very recently we saw Aegis take out, it was in the Red Sea, um, it took out three cruise missiles that were fired from Yemen heading to Israel. And it's like, mm, I don't know if they're coming at me, but I'm going to kill them anyways. And what did it do? It smoked all three of them. Boom, fast forward two weeks. This was just earlier this week. Somebody Houthi Rebels again saw an American uh, carrier out there. They saw an American uh, DDG out there, and they're like, "We're gonna, we're gonna fire this drone at this small drone that they can't see, and we're gonna sneak on in." And he just said, "The fuck you are, not in my house." Fucking, it went straight. Uh, what's that name? The Terry Tate office linebacker. Yeah, it went straight Terry Tate on their bitch ass, and just fucking, just get out of here, March Madness that shit. The Aegis combat system is revolutionary. It really is. And the more I dug into it, the more curious I am about it. Um, the downside is, from what I'm, I'm reading, I don't know how true it is, the Ticonderoga class are going down. They are all eventually being sent away for reasons that I don't fully understand. Could be their cost, could be their, their size. They just don't have a use for them anymore. Um, but we don't have very many of them. They're starting to go away. The Arleigh Burke class destroyers were already supposed to start going away and being replaced with the Zumwalt class destroyers. But cost and a bunch of other things uh came up with the zumwalt class destroyer so right now every single arleigh burke class destroyer that has ever been made for the united states navy is still in service with the united states navy they were supposed to start decommissioning them they haven't started doing that yet uh the zumwalt kind of they they came out they built five of them and they're like these suck and they started taking them down so that being said I hope it was a decent synopsis of everything on board these ships and how they work and, and how they talk to one another um it, it's really a revolutionary system and having worked with IBCS myself for several years, seeing it in action and function on board naval platforms gives me hope that the, the program will mature one day and, and get finished because whew, it, it needed some help at least there for a little while. I haven't been on the system in about a year or so. So <laughs> with that being said, don't give it to the 22 a day. Every single one of you are amazing and I will see you guys right here next time. Play me out. Thank <laughs> you.